will be of interest to you all, and uh, hopefully it will seed some uh, interaction among us such that we might uh, actually see some paths forward. Okay, so the title of the talk, Metabolic Interaction Networks for the Whole Community. It's a little bit of a misnomer because I'm not actually going to give you a metabolic network solution to understanding microbial communities in nature. However, I hope, again, going back to this problem statement, stimulate you to think about how one might create such interaction networks because this is something that we very much need in the field of metagenomics is a way of visualizing, a way of creating networks that describe distributed metabolic pathways that exist in community. So I'm going to start off, though, with something very familiar to us all. This is the matrix, right? And we've all learned how to read it. That's why actually we're in school, in a way, to learn how to read it. And this matrix defines reality, right? It defines our reality. No, that's a movie, but okay, for the purposes of this talk, in the purposes of this visionary film, this code represents consciousness when you are a human fuel cell for the, for the, uh, for the computer minds. Now, guarding this matrix, are sentinels. And these sentinels exist to go out and to hunt for those human beings whose consciousness has somehow been separated from the matrix. And their job is to prevent that human consciousness from seeking its own reality. I'm not going to be here to talk to you tonight about that matrix. I would rather talk to you about the real matrix. This real matrix, and it is a real matrix, is made out of G's, A's, T's, and C's. Okay. This is the, the code of life that runs through us, of course. Many of us study in the context of disease, but most importantly, this matrix is moving through us, through the microbial communities that comprise us. It's in the air that we breathe, it's in the soils, it's in the oceans, it's everywhere around us. In fact, it really is. The closest thing I can imagine in my human consciousness of reality to the matrix that I just showed you, and it is indeed guarded by sentinels. And microorganisms are the sentinels of this matrix. And unlike the sentinels of the film that go after people, I mean, occasionally there are a few pathogens that may cause us ill. The reality is that these sentinels actually do important things. And they make life possible. They're the guardians of metabolism. So you think about millennia. No, let's go back further, geological time. Billions of years of evolution. The history of that evolution is stored in microbial genomes. Okay. They guard all the metabolic capacity of the planet. And they provide ecosystem services. Okay, and we're going to talk about that tonight. So I'm trying to shift the paradigm a little bit away from disease and refocus a little bit on the good works that these sentinels perform. And using the word sentinel here is microbial communities also are sentinels of environmental change. So if we can find ways of listening in to their conversations, if you will, we may be able to use those conversations to learn more in a predictive way about where our environment is headed or ways of modulating our environment for more sort of beneficial outcomes. Of course, this is the promise and the hope of the microbiome project, that by understanding our interactions with our commensals, that we'll have a better route towards therapeutics. Now, imagine being able to scale that onto ecosystem level processes. We might be able to make the world a better place, right? So. The key here is that microbes are ubiquitous and abundant, right? That's the matrix idea, that the DNA component of the microbial world is all around us. And these are numbers to help put that in perspective. There are approximately, and this is, an, again, an estimate. Is there a pointer here? The oh, the mouse, indeed. OK, so there are approximately 10 to the 30 microorganisms on Earth. This is an estimate, and this is culled from a number of literature sources, and it's broken down by habitat from aquatic, oceanic, and terrestrial sources. Okay, sum that up, 10 to the 30. Well, let's put that in perspective. 10 to the 11 neurons in a brain, 10 to the 14 cells in a body, 10 to the 22 stars in the known universe. So what does the numerical abundance of microbial communities in the world around us really mean? Well, with respect to that matrix, okay, these organisms are not defined morphologically as being wonderful examples of Darwin's finches, right? The, the, the morphological diversity that we typically associate with macroscopic organisms, we just don't find it here. Microorganisms have excelled at that metabolic differentiation. This is what's inside of them. It's these pathways that do work at the molecular level. 
And so just to put that in perspective with respect to genomic innova innovation, this is just a, a kind of a, a back of the envelope type of calculation to think about for four simultaneous mutations in one gene. Now we're going to have some assumed rates of mutation here. We're going to say that mutations per generation is approximately 10 to the minus 26. And let's say we wanted to estimate the frequency of mutations in some marine population of bacteria that we had quantified to be about 8 times 10 to the 29th cells per year. At that rate, we would come up with about 2.1 times 10 to the 4 mutations per year. And if we wanted to convert that to mutations or hours per mutation, we can come up with something on the order of 0.4 hours per mutation. So what I'm trying to say is rare things can happen frequently in this microbial matrix. And that leads to uh, a selection, a, a substrate for natural selection at levels that we can't really appreciate given our own generational span. And the other thing to think about with respect to this matrix is the open source evolution aspect of it. Gene flow, it's not just a mutation and selection acting neutrally on, on a neutral mutation. It's that genes are actively exchanged. And so there was a paper written about 10 years ago which suggests that, you know, thinking about early life scenarios, um, lateral gene transfer probably were really kind of important in developing uh, the genotypic structures that we, that we see today. And when we talk about prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea, the idea is that there was this kind of constructive evolution in the early phase of cellularization in which genetic information was passed much more freely. And that you can think about that almost like an information superhighway. Even today, you, know, you study antibiotic resistance. That's just one example of gene flow from one group of organisms to another group of organisms under selection. But that's happening on many levels across many different modes of selection. It could be a carbon substrate utilization or the ability to use light energy to pump protons. And our own eukaryotic evolution, it, it seems to operate on somewhat different terms. And so from the standpoint of this matrix, that's why I call it a microbial matrix, because these organisms are much more capable of horizontal transfer than we are. And so this is sort of a representation of that matrix in the context of network space, where nodes are genomes. A broken line in a node would represent an extinct genotype. A closed circle would represent an extant genotype. And then these interconnections are showing the patterns of vertical versus horizontal gene transfer between those genotypes. It's very convoluted. Our notional perspective on a tree of life is much more linear than this type of representation. This is another way to envision the evolutionary history of microbial communities. A similar way of thinking about, though, these communities is from the standpoint of a biochemical matrix or a biochemical network, if you will. And these are a whole series of biogeochemical processes, these transformations that take place in the natural environment that have big, uh, big effects on large-scale ecosystem level processes. And these are the metabolic profiles of microorganisms in the environment. Microbes mediate these transformations, okay, from nitrogen fixation to sulfur for oxidation processes to iron respiration or ammonia oxidation or methane production. Okay, so these are all transformations that individual and collectively in communities microorganisms are mediating and these have large scale effects. And so if we move up from the standpoint of that individual cell down here at 10 to the minus 9 kilometers, the, the manifestation of this metabolism has planetary implications. Okay. And so if you think about that in the wide swath of planetary history, what you see is 4.6 odd year, billion years of evolution. Okay, here's the formation of the Earth, and all the way on the other end there's the Earth we know today. The Earth has gone through various transformations. We think, looking back, there may have been a state when the planet's atmosphere was more methane rich. There was a point where there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. There was an oxidation event due to the evolution of microorganisms whose pollution, whose byproduct is oxygen, right? You think about that, photosynthesis. The byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. It changed the world. And for most of the evolution of the planet, the history of life has been microbial. So if we think about microgenic effects, three and a half billion years of microbial influence on the environment. Where we fit in is right at the end. How many billion years? Not. How many million years? Seven? Our ancient ancestors? Homo erectus? You know, we've been here such a short time. 
And the, the, the interesting thing to think about is the influence that we're capable of having is almost on that scale, right? The ability to change the atmosphere. Before us, only microbes could do it. And so the foundations I want to instill tonight, these are sort of formative questions, and then we'll get into the informatics. How does microbial community structure contribute to ecosystem function? Now, we want to understand that, we want to model it. What are the taxonomic and metabolic profiles that define these microbial communities? What are the genes? How do they fit together into pathways? How do the profiles themselves change in response to natural or anthropogenic disturbances? So over space and time, how do these pathways differ from one another? And then let's say in response to climate change, can we use the response of those communities as sensitive indicators for our ability to affect the consequences of climate change, i.e. remediate? And what is the role of the environment in shaping the genetic landscape of microbial communities? And so again, this is sort of a nature-nurture type of effect. So the environment selects. So how does the environment select the metabolic potential of the community? So effectively, we want to thread from genomes to biomes. We want to move from this information-rich genome and transcriptome and proteome that might exist within a single cell responding to the world. And we want to take that information and we want to put it into a community context. Because microbial communities are really the key to everything I've just told you. It's not just the individual behavior of a single cell. It's the network behavior of interacting cells. And not just identical clonal populations, but mixed assemblages of organisms that have different metabolic potentials. And so this idea here is this type of network that doesn't exist, that we want to build. How do we build that distributed metabolic network where a cell is, a fen is, is like the EC number? Okay? Cell A makes a substrate that cell B can then utilize in an enzymatic pathway. Okay? So these are the types of distributed systems we're trying to understand. And they have these big effects, higher order effects from our own bodies. Here are uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria and root nodules doing their business all the way to the global carbon cycle. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus a little bit tonight on the top, on the carbon cycle. I'm going to try to tell a little story about how microbial communities are very important to regulating carbon flux in the environment. What we're going to do is use environmental genomics or metagenomics to do, to do this, to tell that story. And so the way to think about this effectively, I'm, I'm not talking about phenotype so much here as I am talking about genotype tonight. I mean, we could spend a whole, well, actually, I lied. We're going to talk a little bit about phenotype towards the end, but I, I'm going to go from how do we capture the genomic potential and then I'm going to end a little bit on how we can validate that. But right now, let's just look at a traditional scheme for how we capture that information. It's all familiar to most of you with respect to getting DNA from a mixed microbial assemblage. We're going to, in this case, size separate that DNA. We're going to clone that DNA into different size um, libraries, maybe make a large insert library, make a small insert library. Nowadays, we can bypass that completely. We can just throw the DNA onto the sequencer in a clone independent way and generate vast amounts of information. But the net effect as we funnel from the mixed community biomass to genomic material to sequence is that we're going to want to take all that information and somehow reorder it. So we break the plurality that is the community. We, we rip open all those cells, we mangle the DNA, we mix it up into billions of puzzle pieces, and then we try to reassemble, reassort those puzzle pieces. And you can imagine that a cloning-based approach, you're going to have a very sparse data set. You're not going to be able to recapture all the genotypes that are in the community at the beginning. We're approaching now with next generation sequencing technologies, much deeper access to the full genomic complement of, of the community. And so this is just a standard way of thinking about coverage in a library context. So if I had to clone DNA from E. coli, let's say, so that I would have representation of every gene in the genome, how many clones would I need? Or if I were making a library of the human genome, how many clones would I need given a length of, let's say, 40,000 base pairs? So here's our length right here, 40 here. Here's our genome size over here. And this is basically saying that I need, oh, you know, 530 clones to cover the E. coli genome. That's not bad. And I, you know, I need uh, you know, quite a few more to cover the human genome. When we think about this from the standpoint of metagenomics, we're talking about mixed microbial communities that are not clonal, as I indicated. You may have on the order of 10 to the 6 cells per gram 
uh, or milliliter, let's say, in seawater to 10 to the 9 cells in a gram of soil. And so you can see quickly that this type of approach to predicting how much sequencing breaks down because the heterogeneity that we find in these mixed assemblages is vast. And for all intents and purposes, every genotype is different from every other genotype. So it's a lot of sequencing we would need to do to reassemble. And I think in one of the papers that I have provided, uh, the primer on metagenomics, they actually do a calculation on how you would estimate the number, the amount of sequencing that you'd have to do to, to basically recover genomes from a mixed microbial community. One of the interesting bioinformatic challenges, I would, I would say, or not so much challenges, but what's lacking is no one's actually written a calculator to do that. Let's say I wanted to come up with a number. I wanted to go to the, the granting agency and say, well, I have to sequence 10 terabytes of data. And it's not because I just want a lot of capacity, but because I've calculated exactly based on the numerical abundance of cells and the number of different species based on some marker for species that this is how much sequencing I need. No one's actually done that. It's kind of curious. And no one's actually followed through and then done it. So maybe someone in a review article somewhere said, here's the equation. But no one's actually tested it to see if it holds up. It's one of these outstanding problems. This is the throughput component, though. So things are changing. So now we're entering a realm where the, just this, 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 this Illumina HiSeq instrument, it, it, they decided we're just going to make an instrument that's two orders of magnitude higher throughput than anything else that we did before. And so it's creating this situation where we have this tsunami effect. This is uh, right here. Okay, I'm telling you, these are the number of microbial genomes or the number of yeast genomes all the way down to the lungfish, which is really big. Okay, this is from the Joint Genome Institute. And so they can sequence a few lungfish genomes a year on one of these instruments. But look at this, you know, 10,000 bacterial genomes on one machine. And so our ability to access that microbial matrix is, is really increasing uh, daily. And as a function of years, so here we are, we're not even, we're here, you know, next year, oh, soon, we're getting close. This is sort of the throughput effect that I showed you on the previous slide down here, okay? But the prediction is as, as these platforms become more robust, that we're going to be expanding this capacity even more, bringing costs down dramatically. And so here's sort of the, 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 the cost per base pair coming down and the amount of throughput going up. And so this is giga, giga, gigabases per run, okay? And so in a matter of five years, we're in another league, order of magnitude again, different. And so the point here is how do we put this information into context? Because we're, 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 we're approaching a, a point where we're, our ability to generate the information far surpasses our ability to actually organize and interpret it. And so this is one of the biggest challenges in metagenomics. And I just want you to be aware of that. I can tell you interesting stories. But the reality is that, that we're not really keeping up analytically uh, with, with the information. So this is an example of a typical assembly whoa, result from a metagenome. Okay, so this is, I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about the communities that this data is derived from. But what you're looking here, it, it's a little bit blurry, uh, is the mean coverage versus contig length. Okay, so here we, we've done 454 sequencing. We've generated uh, a large set of reads and we've tried to assemble them together. All right. And what you can see in this distribution is that the vast majority of our assembly is not much of an assembly at all. We get a few contigs that assemble 30,000 base pairs and so forth, but for the most part, we're back here, short reads that don't find each other. So again, sparse coverage of the whole community or very high levels of heterogeneity which prevent robust assembly because most of the assemblers that we work with don't deal with, let's say, insertions and deletions very well. So that's one of the things about microbial genomes. They're very fluid. They're very dynamic. And so it could very well be that this is part of it. If we could just find a way to somehow bin all this information such that we could assign each of those contexts to a particular taxonomic group or a particular uh, metabolic pathway, we might be able to find some meaning in there. And so this is the point, interwoven complexity. The multiple coexisting genomes are represented in a single sample. And we've got a cross-section of all the naturally occurring heterogeneity at the time of sampling. There's this lateral gene transfer problem 
And we have limited functional information on most of the data. And I mean, how do you test it? Like, you know, we don't have a genetic system for all organisms. So we can make an annotation, but how do we know that that annotation is accurate? And finally, this limited sample coverage issue. So if you're using a cloning-based approach to metagenomes, you're really just sampling. Every clone comes from a different genotype, basically. With the next generation approaches now, your coverage is higher, and so you're sampling individual genotypes more frequently. And you have the possibility, the real possibility, with the next, next generation sequencing of starting to attain bona fide representational assemblies for the community. But that's a few years from, from now. So um, this is my Humpty Dumpty analogy, okay? I know it's hard to see, but the point I'm trying to make here is all that information that we're able to generate from that community, it's, it's pretty much a Humpty Dumpty problem in effect right now. We can't reassemble complete genomes. It's, it's really not been done very much from the environment. In the few cases that it's been done, it's happened because a particular organism was very abundant. It might be naturally enriched. If you find a sample like that, it's pretty cool. We've done that a few times. We found an environment where one particular group of organisms represented 65% of all the bacteria. So it's very abundant, and it made up 65% of the genomic material we recovered, and we could assemble a genome. But for the most part, we're not able to put those genomes back together again. So what we're left with is a parts list. So here is uh, the engine, parts list of the engine. I think it's for a jaguar. And, you know, we can do this. We can say, all right, we have all these genes that we didn't assemble, right? They're over here in our, in our plot. And we can assign each one of these to a particular place in this inventory of parts. So, you know, we're getting somewhere. At least now we can appreciate that there's an ATPase, there's an electron transport chain. But really what we're dealing with is a landscape, okay? Because if, for instance, oops, I didn't label it. Well, if this is a population of related organisms, this is a population of related organisms, and this is a population of related or organisms, each of these peaks would represent a genotype. All right? So there's a vast amount of diversity, even within the closely related components of an individual population. These are not like clonal groups that we've grown up in the laboratory. These are individual cells that are all sort of living in their own particular niche space. And they're being selected to thrive in a particular set, under a particular set of environmental conditions. So when we sample that community, we have to deal with all this cryptic diversity at the genotypic level. What we'd like to be able to do is develop a network of interactions that define these populations and this whole community. Of course, this network isn't that informative. What we'd like to be able to do is deconvolute that. What we'd like to be able to do is zoom in on particular aspects of this network and compare the network from one community to another community. And we'd like to be able to do that dynamically. We'd like to be able to do that over time. How does that network change in response to perturbation? These are the same problems that people who are doing systems biology would articulate. These are not, there's probably nothing new to anybody in this room. So we really like to be able to do that in metagenomics, but the reality is we don't even know right now what the best network is. To, what kind of network should we draw? We certainly don't have the level of transcription information for interactions or expression. You know, certainly we don't know which proteins interact. Most of these are hypothetical. Is it a gene-based network, a taxonomically relevant network? How do we do that? And these are the sorts of questions that, uh, you know, my lab and other labs are, are, are thinking about. So what we want to do is take that network, okay, for an individual cell in the context of this community of organisms, and we want to try to relate that to the biogeochemical processes in the world around us. So here's the biogeochemical network, here's the community network, and we want to be able to say, functionally speaking, that this particular community of organisms is driving this particular series of biogeochemical reactions. That is the ultimate goal. So what's this? Anybody know? Methane. methane, right. So that's what I want to share with you, my methane. Now really, I want you to understand that, that this is an important biogeochemical process, the conversion of carbon dioxide into methane and the conversion of methane into carbon dioxide. In fact, you know methane's a potent greenhouse gas. And so what I want to do is highlight a specific set of microbes in the environment that are in integral 
to uh, filtering methane, okay? Because they actually keep the environment that we know relatively stable. Okay, methane's a potent greenhouse gas. It's been fluctuating on geological time scales in the atmosphere. In that one image I showed you, I had that orange planet between 4.5 and 2.3 billion years. It's speculated that at one point that our Earth had quite a bit of methane in the atmosphere. And in fact, that global warming was good for the evolution of life at that point in time. Um, methanogenic organisms, organisms producing methane, would have thrived under those conditions, as well as organisms capable of using it. We also have seen that over geological time that methane in the atmosphere does fluctuate, and it does seem to correlate with periods of warming. And so we think about this as a greenhouse gas that is an agent of global change. So this is an image of methane production sort of in the present. Okay, and you can see these hot spots of production over different regions of the world. And the point is that this is increasing, right? We human beings are increasing the methane burden of the atmosphere. However, there are offsets, okay? And those offsets exist in the natural world, in the oceans in particular, in the marine sediments. And the, the major correlation from a biogeochemical perspective that I want you to appreciate is that in the open ocean, okay, in the sediments, sulfate is high. And along the ocean margins, like that would be the right around where the continents are, right? Okay. It's very low. And people have gone in and drilled holes and they've measured sulfate. Conversely, methane is really high along the continental margins and almost completely gone in the open ocean. So again, that's what this plot is showing. These circles indicate these places where there's a lot of methane in the sediment. Now, the point here is that very little of that methane gets out. Sulfate isn't there. Methane is in abundance. Hmm. Why doesn't that methane just sort of leave? Get into the ocean, get into the atmosphere. Well, it turns out that there's actually, this is very complicated, the take home message is there is a zone in the sediments where sulfate is dis disappearing and methane is disappearing right here. And this zone is known as a sulfate methane transition zone. It's a natural biogeochemical boundary. It's a sink for methane gas in the environment. And it's not simply a chemical process or a geochemical process. It's a biologically driven consumption of methane right there at the transition. And when you look at something like that, if you were trying to come up with an equation to explain it, you might say, well, sulfate plus methane equals something. That didn't work out too well. The error got busted. But basically, methane and sulfate yields bicarbonate and sulfide and water. And so this is a geochemical equation. You can calculate using some rules of thermodynamics how much free energy is yielded by that reaction. It's not very much. Minus 25 kilojoules per mole. It's not really enough to make a living if you were an organism using this as your sole way of making a living in the world. And yet it happens. And so this process known as the anaerobic oxidation of methane serves as a biological methane filter. It filters about 384 billion kilograms of methane per year from the seafloor. Um, and it actually is the result of this reverse methanogenesis process, okay? So the idea is that there's actually two components to that single equation. So the first half of the reaction is methane goes to, again, my arrows got shifted around in this, this MAC-PC conversion, but methane goes to uh, carbon dioxide and some reduced compound. In this case, it's hydrogen. That hydrogen gets passed on to sulfate-reducing bacteria that use it as a source of electrons, and they respire sulfate. They produce hydrogen sulfide. That hydrogen sulfide, you know, that's an interesting gas. We don't have time to talk about it tonight, but it actually is used by a lot of other organisms. So this becomes part of a trophic structure in the marine sediments. So you take the two half reactions, you combine them, you get that reaction that I showed you, the geochemical equation. And it was speculated for a long time that this happened. There wasn't any culture, and there still isn't a culture, but people didn't even know who was doing it, right? They, they thought there were probably bacteria that do it, but they didn't know who. But here was the model. Something oxidizing the methane and something reducing sulfate using electrons from the first part of the reaction. And people did. They found the organisms. They lit them up based on fluorescent and CGO hybridization. They built probes to the ribosomal RNA sequences and lit those cells up. And there were two main types. Okay, there are these filamentous types, 
known as ANME1, and these aggregate forming types, known as ANME2 in red here. These are archaea that are closely related to methanogens. These are archaea that make methane. So it fuels speculation again that it is a reversal of a process that actually is pretty well understood. Intriguingly, in this case, you see these ANME2 archaea actually form an alliance with sulfate-reducing bacteria. So it really validated, in many respects, this model, that you could have partnerships in nature that would mediate this process. Okay, we've come to learn a lot. There's quite a bit of diversity within these populations of ANME1 and ANME2. And what I want to share with you is how we go about identifying the genotypes and assembling the genomic architecture of these groups of organisms in the absence of cultivation by going directly to the environment. Okay. And so, just to share briefly with you what it's like, I hope this plays. It may not. Oh well, I can't do it. Sadness. So basically, we, we take a robot down. I don't get on the robot, somebody controls it. And it goes down to the seafloor. There are these bubbles coming up. I don't think you can see them. This is a place where methane is venting from the seafloor. And we take cores of that sediment. And then we section those cores. We pull out genomic DNA from the mud, effectively. So the message from the mud, we try to translate. OK. And so here's the library production pipeline. So what I'm going to share with you in terms of the actual um, information content here. We have roughly, um, I don't know, something on the order of 130 million base pairs of sequence data that we're going we're gonna to be using to try to reconstruct uh, the, the genomic signature of these methane oxidizing archaea. Uh, in an assembly context, this is the first thing we try to do to reduce the redundancy of our data set, we have about 40,000 scaffolds derived from this summed that's 120 million base pairs. And that leaves us with about 52 million base pairs. So if you think about the average microbial genome, when I hear I'm talking about archaea and bacteria, something on the, somewhere between 2 and 5 million base pairs. Okay? So we have the coverage in theory here to begin assembling the genotypes of some of the more abundant members of our community. So what we can do is we can go into that space, okay, and we can say, well, what kinds of functional genes are there that we might be interested in? And I alluded to the fact that these groups are related to known methanogenic organisms. Okay, so we can say, well, look in the literature, and there's a lot known about how methane is produced. So can we find the genes that are typically associated with the production of methane in our sequence space? And indeed, we can do that, and we can reconstruct a pathway based on the presence of these various methane-producing genes that when they run in a particular direction, they're involved in the production of methane. They're all there in our community where methane is being consumed. So now we start to speculate that this is a reversible reaction. Again, that's consistent with the hypothesis, but here we're actually finding the functional equivalence that would do the work. And we can, we can chart the presence of those genes in our different libraries. It's very hard to read. We can look in various forms of the sequence, small insert libraries, large insert libraries, next generation sequencing data sets, okay? So this is a way, effectively, without assembling the genome, to start to put together the parts list that I alluded to before. And so that's a standard way of doing business in, in a metagenomic context. Okay, we haven't really assembled individual genomes, but we've got the parts now that define certain pathways. And at least we can start to speculate on the biogeochemical process uh, that's taking place. But what we really want to be able to do is identify all of the DNA sequences in our assembly, in our partial assembly, that can be assigned to a particular taxonomic group. So we want to be able to bin the information into ANME1 versus ANME2. Or if you think about that fitness landscape, those individual peaks, we want to be able to start assigning DNA from each of those peaks. So one way we can do that is we can take a functional anchor approach. So in this case, we're looking at one of the genes from here, the, the gene that mediates this step right here, in the case of methane oxidation, would be the first step, methylquons MM reductase. And it's a, a pretty robust marker for this phenotype. And we can put our ANME sequences in a phylogenetic context. Now, anytime we find a sequence that goes here, or here, or here, or here, or here, we know that that is a methane oxidizing signature. 
So anytime we have an assembly and we find a contig that has a gene that falls here or here or here or here, we can say that belongs to ME1 or that belongs to ME2. So the ideal situation would be to find many anchors like this. We can run through our assembly. We can find every contig that has a gene that we can assign in a phylogenetic context, put them aside into bins. It's like putting together a puzzle. Find the edges. Find the colors that go together. And now we're starting to bin sequences so that we can do these distributed types of pathway reconstructions. And so we can, we can take that a step further. And we can use principal coordinate or principal component analysis. And we can combine that with a look at the oligonucleotide frequency patterns of the DNA itself. So this is, in, in a way, this is independent of any kind of gene prediction. Now we're just looking at the intrinsic sequence itself. And what we're doing here is each one of these dots in the ordination space represents uh, a large fragment of DNA that's been assembled, okay? And what we're able to do based on those intrinsic patterns, in this case we're looking at trimers, tetramers, and pentamers, okay? We can cluster them together into discrete areas within the ordination space, here, here, here. And we can map on information like these functional anchors. Okay. We can assign particular sequences now to particular groups. And when we do that, we're actually able to start to see three groups emerge within this distribution that correlate with ANME1 and ANME2. And we'll get to which is which in a moment. So as I alluded to, we want to find a collection of these markers that we can use for that bidding purpose. And you may have heard about this from Young earlier today, but there's a, a very nice pipeline uh, called ML Tree Map, which actually has taken 40 genes that are known to be very robust phylogenetic anchors, indicators for particular organisms. And we can run our data through that. And what it's going to do is it's going to try to find all of those genes and then place them into this tree. This is a tree of all trees. So this is just summing all 40 of those in a matrix, saying how many of this one, how many of this one, how many of this one, mapped on to the tree of all trees. But each one of those 40 genes has its own tree. And we can go into those individual trees, and this is just an example of one, and we can look for patterns. And in this case, we can see these are all scaffolds in our assembly that are associated with, they form a clade here. They all contain this particular gene. And here's another clade here. And embedded in there are these large insert clones that have linkage to a small subunit ribosomal RNA gene, unambiguous taxonomic identification. So we are able to basically name this clade. We can say all of these scaffolds are associated with ANME1A, which is a subtype. It's one peak within the ANME1 population. And all of these over here are associated with ANME1B. This is another peak within the ANME1 population. If we do this iteratively for all 40 of these markers, plus any others that we can identify, we start to build up a repository of very highly probable um, sequences that originate from a given source. So here's an example where we do this again. Okay? Now what we're doing is we're determining these cluster boundaries based on those 40 independent taxonomically informative genes. So you can see the same clusters are resolved. The same pattern, it's actually grown a little bit here. We've assigned even more of these points. So we're starting to take all of these fragments in that assembly and put them into meaningful taxonomic bins. And now, if we do that with, um, we basically draw a boundary. We find all instances of uh, a, a contig or a scaffold that we can assign, and we connect the dots, we're able to create a much larger bin. So presumably, every gene that falls in this area, or this area, or this area, originates from a particular subtype, ME1A, ME1B, ME2, et cetera. So now we're in the position of actually taking these bins, moving inside them, and saying, what is the metabolic potential of a given bin? And so if you take that approach, what you're able to do, and again, from a comparative standpoint, is you say, well, what are the genes that these bins share in common? And what are the genes that are unique? Okay, it's a first step towards identifying the functional differences that may enable these particular subtypes to persist in the environment. So you can see that there's really not a lot shared in common, but 867 to 1,000 genes in common. And each one of these ANME1 subtypes has quite a bit of genetic information that is unique. So we speculate that, I mean, this is not new, right? I mean, Welch published paper looking at E. coli. 
many years ago. It's the same pattern. 40% almost differentiation between strains of E. coli at the genotypic level. So we're not seeing anything new here, but it's really intriguing. What are those genes? Because we know that those are the genes in that accessory gene pool that are probably really important in defining the ecological adaptations of these organisms. And that's going to translate or feed back into these biogeochemical processes that we're interested in. Okay. Another way we can support this, and this is pending work, this isn't, I'm not going to present the data, is we can take it a step further. And we can actually try to physically separate these cells in the environment using a microfluidic approach. We're doing this with the Hansen lab, where we can then trap a single, this is one aggregate, one of those anime two aggregates, okay? And we can then subject that to whole genome amplification, all right? So imagine an array of 100 or 1,000 of these individual aggregates. Each can be genotyped. And now you can start to get into that distribution, all of the peaks. All of those peaks in the fitness landscape can be compared to one another. And we can begin to really understand the genetic adaptations of these particular organisms. Okay, so this is sort of a summary of that approach. With the throughput that we're approaching, we'll actually be able to identify all those peaks, compare them to one another, and really define these core and accessory gene pools that are so important to understanding the metabolic function of these organisms in the environment. And so the last thing I wanted to say, uh, and I'll go through this quickly, not to uh, keep us from the food much longer, is that we really want to be able to validate these models, okay? So one gene is really many hypotheses, you, especially when you get out into the, the, these natural communities. We're not in a position to express every single one and assess the function, do two hybrid screens, to crystallize the proteins. There's just too much diversity for us to do all that. So informatically, the challenge is to make the best gene predictions that we can, and then if possible, to validate at least that the genes themselves are expressed. We'd like to be able to do that the same way that people working in a model do that. The genes are expressed under these conditions, right? It's not impossible to do that. If you sample enough in terms of a natural community, you're effectively able to do uh, the equivalent of a, a controlled microarray experiment where you've asked, okay, uh, under this temperature, under this particular treatment with this particular drug, these genes are upregulated, these genes are downregulated. It's just a bit more challenging when you have to send a robot 3,000 feet down to the seafloor to collect your samples every day or every hour. It's just a bit more challenging. What we've done is we sort of bypassed the transcriptome. We've gone directly to the proteome to try to validate our, our pathways. Okay. And so one of the tools we had to build to do that was a database. Now, I don't, I, Daniel, don't worry. This, this, this isn't built yet, okay? This is something that we're doing in collaboration with the Pacific Northwest National Lab uh, in the U.S. And it, it's called IMPROV, and it stands for Integrated Metaproteomics Viewer. And what this database does is it basically takes community genome information, it clusters it using a, 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 a scale blast program that does all self-blasts to all the data, creates these clusters, and then it takes mass spectral data and it maps that onto these clusters of predicted genes. Then it arrays that information uh, using uh, tree maps, actually, which is, a, I thought, a pretty nice way to uh, organize the data. And so what you're seeing here is a graphical uh, instance of how improv works. Each one of these is a, is a protein cluster of clusters, okay? So this, they scale by size here. So these would be clusters of, let's say, one. Just one ORF that didn't find any other partners, and they're getting bigger as we move to the edges. So this is quite a big cluster. The, pre, the, the detection of peptides now that map to a given cluster is scaled here in yellow. So I'm just sort of schematizing it from low to high, but the, the hot spots, the places that are very yellow represent proteins that are highly expressed in our metagenome, okay? And what's very cool is that in this particular sample from the Eel River Basin where we went and sampled the sediment, the most abundant proteins happen to be here, here, and here. And those represent methylcoenzyme reductase, which is that first step in the methane oxidation pathway that I shared with you before. And so what we're hoping to be able to do with Improv is use it as an organizational framework for looking at patterns of gene expression, but also being able to compare metagenomes. So we, we want to be able to compare biogeographically, spatially, for instance. Okay, this is the particular environment off the coast of Mendocino, California. Now can I overlay an environment from, let's say, the Black Sea? All right? And can I actually show 
some type of pattern in using a hierarchical clustering approach of how similar those two profiles are to one another. So this is being developed, um, and it, again, it's the kind of thing that it takes a lot of time. It's hard to convince sometimes funding agencies, but we're, uh, we're making progress. So finally, just to summarize, we're able to take that pathway that I picked out, that parts list, we're actually able to identify the proteins that represent uh, all the steps in that pathway. So at least we can functionally validate this one particular process of methane transformation, uh, combining these approaches. And I think to conclude, I'm just going to go to the, the image here. What I've tried to do is take you through both more of a philosophical and theoretical approach to metagenomics as a field of inquiry, but also through a practical case study in which we sample the environment, we create genomic sequence information representing that particular sample in the environment at that particular time. We go through a series of data transformations to try and bin all of that sequence information into populations that we can then use that information to conduct pathway reconstruction. In this case, I just focused on one pathway, but you could look at the whole metabolic inventory of, of, of each of these populations. I mean, if you wanted to, you could look at the TCA cycle for that matter. And then finally, to validate that construct using a proteomic approach in this case, with the understanding that what we'd really like to be able to do, and we're trying to do collectively as a community, is to profile these microbial communities, not in culture, but in their natural state and to try to understand their responses to perturbation and how those communities are contributing to important biogeochemical processes like the one that I mentioned at the outset, which in this case would be the global methane cycle. So I'm going to end there and uh, acknowledge the funders and of course the people in the lab. And just, I, I put the names in bold who've contributed at some level to this talk. Uh, you'll note there's some faces, uh, some names that are faces in the audience. I've put um, a, a symbol next to those, at um, Young. Uh, Daniel is currently a rotation student in the lab, and, and Yaoji, who's not directly related to this project, but some of the coding that she's doing, some of the scripts she's developing are very useful in terms of some of the data transformations that, uh, that we're doing. So uh, thanks for your attention. Fascinating. Uh, do you have any questions for Steve? Uh, I, I have one, which yeah. is sort of a. So, I mean, hopefully, I think people got the point that this is very computationally intensive and, yeah. and, and informatics heavy. So, I was wondering if you just had a sort of had some thoughts about what where you see the big challenges are in informatics. And you mentioned a few things, but. Um, you know, is it is it algorithms? Is it tools? Is it just analysis effort? Where, what, what are the what are the right. bottlenecks? Yeah, all of those things are bottlenecks, but to varying extents. So you can think about the width of the bottleneck varying. Uh, I, I would argue computationally, uh, you know, there are tools out there, that, or I should say, services out there. Okay, I, I certainly cannot get NSERC to buy me more nodes. I've tried, but there's something like you know. Now we're using WestGrid, right? So there are there are clusters out there that you can tap into. Uh, from that standpoint, so it's that's um, not uh, as wide of uh, not as what is it, not as narrow a bottleneck. Okay, uh, you just have to be creative. Uh, I would argue that really where the bottlenecks are at this point are in places like the algorithms. Okay, How, like can you come up with accurate binning algorithms that are going to enable you to take that mixture of reads and start to assign them to specific taxonomic groups so that you can do more accurate metabolic reconstruction. Uh, there are some tools available. There's something called uh, Fimble that was developed from Steven Salzberg's lab. Uh, Arthur Brady was a graduate student that worked on that. And it tries to do that. It uses a combination of hidden Markov models and BLAST to provide a probability that sequence A is derived from organism X. And it, you know, it, it does okay, but the problem there is, of course, it needs a training set in order to perform well. Where do you get the training set from? Like, what is your training set? And, you know, we're still trying to figure out what the, the optimal way of, of running uh, that type of program is. Assembly, right? As I alluded to earlier, uh, the assemblers don't work well where, when you have lots of insertions and deletions. And so, you know, if we had a, a, a way of assembling this type of, of sequence information knowing that it's a mosaic assembly. We're not assembling a single solution. We're assembling uh, sort of a, a, a population genome that is full of insertions and deletions of, of lateral gene transfer, of, of, of islands that are apparent. Uh, 
we don't really have tools for that sort of thing. So we're left with this binning. We're left with this kind of distribution of peaks that represent a, a given subset of the population. Uh, visual analytics in general, okay? We don't have good visualization tools. We don't, we don't have the ability to create these complex networks in a meaningful way and compare them to one another. I don't think we're the only ones with that challenge, but certainly that's something that you know, I would like to do personally. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot with Martin uh, Shvinsky about this. Uh, I think he's actually developed a pretty interesting way of looking at networks uh, recently that's uh, analogous to Circos, but specifically built for networks. And so we're going to start exploring the application of that. But I'd say more generally that the, the, the major bottlenecks are places where you've got the information, you've got some good questions, but you don't know how to translate that information into meaningful patterns that help you answer those questions or build new hypotheses. And so I can take the low-hanging fruit here. I can say, well, I know anime are important. They're abundant. They, you know, they represent 30 or 40 percent of that metagenome, and I can do things with them. But what about that long tail in the distribution that I don't know anything about? They're relevant to the environment, but they're extremely difficult to access. And so thinking about ways to amplify those signatures informatically, as well as actually at the bench, you know, cell sorting and separation and whole genome amplification, that sort of thing, uh, I think is another area for uh, exploration. And finally, how do you test the hypothesis? I mean, I alluded to using proteomics, but the reality is that if, if I did a proteome of my blood, what do you think I'd find? Like, what would be the top protein in my blood? I don't actually know the answer. I want to make it up. Pla hemoglobin, okay, Pla platelets, uh, you know, the components of platelets. So basically, there's a skewed distribution that I have to deal with. There's certain really abundant proteins, and then there's, again, this long tail of more uh, poorly expressed or, or low, more lowly level expression of these proteins. So think about that from a population standpoint. I mean, we detected methylchloramine reductase. It was about 40% of all the peptides that we found from the mud. Okay. And, and then everything else is just like one instance or two instances of, of maybe three or four hundred or five hundred, maybe I think we found a couple thousand in the end. But you know genotypically that there are, there, there are millions of potential proteins in that environment. And so, you know, people have been moving more into the transcriptomic approach. Uh, to try to, to deal with this. And, I, you know, I'm learning more recently about, like, uh, ribo, what, what, what's it, uh, ribo, rib, riboseq, where you pull down ribosomes so that you can actually see which RNAs are being translated. So, you know, maybe that is, you know, maybe that's a future direction. Um, but again, going back to figuring out how to take the next generation approaches and use that type of data stream in this context. Because there you're going to start to access the tail of the distribution. And there you're going to actually start to have the ability to maybe assemble more coherent genomes. And at that point, maybe the problem becomes more tractable, it becomes more familiar. Now you're just doing comparative genomics. Uh, you know, that, that could be one scenario. But what I would say is that, you know, looking forward, the last thing, and I'm going to stop, is that from a community point of view, what you really want to be able to do is compare not just individual members of the community, but you want to be able to compare communities as a whole. You want to be able to define a, a metabolic interaction map that represents the community. So you want to kind of step outside of that, that, that lipid bilayer and think about that. I, I, I think I struggle with this, okay? I don't quite have a coherent vision of what that is yet. Uh, it, it breaks a few of the formal rules of cellular organization. I appreciate that. But it's important from the standpoint of modeling environments and modeling ecosystem function. We need to have these maps, and we don't have them yet. So those would be sort of from a creative point of view things to think about if you're interested in, in metagenomics. Yeah. Yeah. So how much would this help you? Uh, Fully assembled genomes, there are lots of tools that you can just take yeah. off the shelf and apply to fully assembled genomes. So it makes the analysis process a bit more tractable, honestly. Uh, it also gives you the comfort of being in familiar territory. Like, I know how to work with a genome. 
You know, I, I, I know how to map that onto this cellular overview of metabolism. What I don't know how to do well is to compare 10 to the 6 genomes on the cellular overview. I don't know how to do that. But I have to learn how to do that. So if I could assemble 10 to the 6 genomes, yes, that would be great. Yeah. Well, in principle, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, in terms of that, that question, like on that plot of the tsunami, uh, if you look at, at that throughput of the HiSeq, uh, I mean, we're, we're into terabytes on the HiSeq in a few years. For some simple communities, in principle, that might, that might do it. The problem, again, is it, there isn't going to be the amount of information, it's going to be the assemblers. The assemblers won't work. The, the ones we have now won't work. It's just too complex of a problem. You, you do the graph. You try to make all the connections. You just, it won't work. So algorithmically, we do need to be thinking on another level of how do you assemble a very, very rich and complex heterogeneous population of related sequences that do go together, but that are not identical to one another. And you know, that, that, I call that the assembly problem. And, and that would be, you know, if we had to come up with an X prize for metagenomics, that would probably be right there at the top. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you take your next questions to Stephen over beers and thank him one more time for a great talk. Thanks. My, my phone.